Well, once again, we're going to be in the Gospel of John uh, this morning. We've been in this series that I've entitled The Big Idea. We've been going through the four Gospels. We'll conclude it next Sunday morning looking at the book of Acts. Uh, and just really, more than anything, just hitting the main emphasis of each one of these books. It's just a, a little reminder today. The, the main emphasis of the Gospel of Matthew was the Messiahship of Christ, the one that they had dreamed about, the one that had been prophesied about for hundreds, really thousands of years, finally shows up. And that's the main emphasis that we find in the Gospel of Matthew. And the Gospel of Mark, it's, excuse me, the Gospel of Mark, put two of those together, Mark, is the servanthood of Christ. And we, we see Jesus over and over and over again serving people. Uh, and we would identify that Jesus is probably the greatest servant of all. And then, as we looked into last week in the Gospel of Luke, we discovered the humanity of Jesus Christ, and more than that, a God who cares about us, a God who is interested in each one of our lives. And so this morning, we're going to now jump into the Gospel of John, the last of the four Gospels, and realize with me that, that, that the Gospel of John almost stands alone as its own Gospel. Why would I say that? Because 92% of what you find in the Gospel of John, you don't find in any of the other three Gospels. If you've ever done any type of biblical study, you've heard what is referred to as the synoptic Gospels. That would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not the Gospel of John, because it tends to stand kind of as its own. So out of his vast storehouse, John, we realize, the writer of this gospel, chose to record incidents or what are often referred to as signs and conversations that would convince the world that Jesus is simply divine. I've entitled this morning's message simply divine. What we're going to uncover today is really one of the foundational beliefs of Cornerstone Church. We have 16 foundational beliefs. One of those is what is referred to as the deity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What, what do we mean by that? That Jesus is God. That Jesus is divine. Go all the way back to the book of Matthew, and they would call him Emmanuel, referring to his birth, Emmanuel, which means, you know it, God with us. So I've entitled this morning's message, once again, Simply Divine. Consequently, John's gospel has no account of the birth of Jesus, no account of his baptism, no account of that temptation experience of Jesus in the wilderness. It tells us nothing of the Last Supper, nothing of Gethsemane, nothing even of Christ's ascension. We find all of that in all the other Gospels. It records not one experience of Christ healing the people possessed by demons. Perhaps most surprisingly of all, it contains, this is shocking, it contains none of the parables of Jesus, the Gospel of John. Although John's Gospel says nothing about any of those events that hold so prominent a place in all the other three Gospels, referred to as the Synoptic Gospels, it has everything to say about the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is God. In fact, so concerned is John that we know Jesus is divine, the opening statement of his Gospel is an, is an assertion of Jesus' deity. Follow along with me. John chapter 1. Pick up with me in the first verse. I'm going to read it from the Living Bible this morning. It says, Before anything else existed, there was Christ with God. He has always been alive and is himself God. It concludes, He created everything there is. Father, we say thank you for your word this morning. God, I just pray over these next few moments that we capture your truth, God, your revelation. God, I also pray that our hearts would be receptive, God, to receive, God, and to respond where necessary to your word in an effective way. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. 
There's been a lot of scholarly thought in regards to the Gospel of John. Uh, let me just give you a few of these thoughts here at the beginning. One made the statement that the Gospel of John is the most important literary production ever composed. F.C. Thompson called it the deepest and most spiritual book in the whole Bible. William Barclay said it's the most precious book in the New Testament. Once again, the Gospel of John. Kyle Yates referred to it as the holy of holies of the entire Bible. And A.T. Robertson said it's the greatest of all books written by man. Just some thoughts from biblical scholars. The book presents the personal recollections of an elderly man who knew and loved and revered his Lord. The elderly man being John himself. The book is filled with life and color, with dramatic power and a Attention to details, John produced, we would say, a never-to-be-forgotten picture of Christ as simply divine. The theme of the deity of Christ runs throughout this whole gospel, and I want to give you just three thoughts as we begin to look at this as a summary, just the big idea of the gospel of John with Jesus being simply divine. Number one, Jesus' nature, Jesus' nature. Is divine. Go back to John chapter 1 once again. Read along with me. It says, Before anything else existed, there was Christ with God. He has always been alive and is himself God. He created everything that there is. If I was to read it from the NIV, it would read this way In the beginning was the Word. Does that begin like any other book of the Bible? You know it, Genesis. In the beginning, God. The Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. Kind of begs that age-old question, when was the beginning? <laughs> Who knows? The geologists say one thing, scientists in other areas say something else, and theologians might still say something different. Nobody really knows where the beginning was. People try to answer that by identifying how old is the world. Is the world 6,000 years old? Is it 7,000 years old? Is it 600,000 years old? Is it 700,000 years old? Is it 6 million years old? Is it 600 million years old? As a pastor here at Cornerstone Church, I'm just going to be honest. I don't know. I'm not sure that I care, but I do know who was there. And that was God. In the beginning, God <laughs> created in the beginning, it says, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God there in the beginning. Now, notice that in the beginning was the Word. The Word refers to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, often referred to as the living Word. In another book that John wrote, Revelations 19 and the 13th verse, John, John again speaks of Jesus as being the Word of God. Because of so, I encourage you to take note of three things about Jesus. Number one, that Jesus is eternal. He didn't begin in time, and he was not the product of his own generation. Scripture identifies in the beginning was the Word. It speaks of the eternity of Jesus. What John was really saying, I believe, is this. Christ is not one of the created things. Christ existed before creation. He actually is the creator of all things. Christ is not part of the world that came into being in time. Christ is part of eternity and was with God before time and before the world even began. Was Jesus. Which again, the theme simply divine. 
what Jesus did was open a window in time that we might see the eternal and unchanging love of God. He is telling us that God was and is and ever will be always just like Jesus is. But people can never know and realize this until Jesus came and dwelt here among us. So we realize that Jesus is eternal. And it identifies the word was with God. I, I use the word affinity to describe the relationship between God and Jesus. Christ and God have always had what is referred to as the most intimate and perfect of relationship or fellowships. No one can tell us what God is like, what God's will is for us, what, what God's love and heart and mind are like, quite as Jesus can make known to each one of us. Jesus, we would say, is that one person in all of the universe who can reveal to us what God is like and how God feels toward us. Why? Because he demonstrated this over and over and over throughout his life here on earth. So Jesus, Jesus is eternal the word was with God and describes that affinity, that relationship between God and Jesus. And then it says back there in John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was God. So I believe right here we find the identity of Jesus Christ. What is this? Christ is the very same essence and being as God. When John said the word was God, he was saying that Jesus is the same as God in mind and also in heart. At the very beginning of the gospel, John makes clear that in Jesus alone, there is perfectly revealed all that God always was, always will be, and all that God feels and once again desires for each one of us. So here, here I've just presented to you our three tremendous truths that we need to begin with. The eternity of Christ, the affinity of Christ, and the identity identity of Christ. What is this? He is God, or we would say he is simply divine. It is his nature to be so. His nature to be so. As I said at the very beginning, we're focusing right now on Jesus's nature is divine. So we go through this throughout the gospel of John, and then we jump all the way toward the end, the second to last chapter. John, John chapter 20, Pick it up in verse 31. Here we find John very pointedly states the main purpose of his book. Think of that for just a moment, church. You've got to almost read his whole book to find the main purpose of his gospel. But he gives it to us in the second to last chapter. I'm going to give it to you, John 20, verse 31. He says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. There it is. And that believing you might have life through his name, John's purpose of his gospel. I remember reading a while back of two friends from the Civil War who sat talking on a train. Both men, one a general and one a colonel, were professed atheists. And for whatever reason, their conversation soon moved to the place of Jesus in religion. One said, I think it's a shame that the historical Jesus has become so encrusted with supernatural superstition. They continued refuting various gospel miracles as nothing more than just legends and myths. Finally, the general suggested someone ought to write a novel about the real Jesus. The colonel responded, that's a good idea, general. You should do it. You could portray Jesus as he really was, a wonder man, yet nothing more. The general then said, I'll do it. History goes on to tell us that he began a careful research on the life of Christ, intending to prove that Jesus was only a man and nothing more. The book was finally written and published. It has sold over more than Two million copies. A movie of the book has provided to be one of the most popular motion pictures of all time. Some of you might already know it, but are my, others might be wondering what's the name of the book, the movie? Ben Hur. Ben Hur. The author, General Wallace. The colonel who challenged him to write the book was 
Colonel Robert Ingersoll, often referred to as America's great agnostic. He identifies the general, that is, while writing the book, he became a sincere believer in the divinity of Christ. He became a believer not because of his rational discovery, but because of his personal experience with the, with the divine Lord, who John said was with God and was God. I believe the voice of General Wallace joins the thousands of countless believers throughout the ages in saying, I believe that Jesus is divine. If you've read the book, watched the movie, just the simplicity of it, it's a Jewish man who just demonstrates love over and over, offering forgiveness to people as a representation of the life of Jesus Christ. But General Wallace came to the realization he was more than just a wonder man. He was divine, that he was God himself. So Jesus' nature is divine. Number two, Jesus' mission is divine. John 1, look at verse 14. It reads, once again, Christ became a human being and lived here on the earth among us. This Christ, we would say, with a divine nature, came on a divine mission. His mission was authorized by no one else than God himself. How do we know? For in John 5, chapter 5, Christ stated six times that he was sent by God. John 5, 23 and 24. John 5, 30. John 5, 36 and 38. Over and over and over again, he identifies that, that he, this mission that he was on was because of God, that God sent him on this mission. Because of so, John recorded eight miracles, not counting Christ's resurrection, to prove that Christ's mission was divine. Six Six of the eight are found only in John's gospel. Only two of these are found in the other. Let me give you the six that are found only in John's gospel. Number one, turning the water to wine in John 2. Number two, healing the nobleman's son in John 4. Number three, healing of the man at the pool in John 5. Number, number four, healing of the man born blind in John chapter 9. Number five, the raising of Lazarus in John 11. And lastly, number six, the miraculous supply of fish in the very last chapter, John chapter 21. In John, these miracles are more than an expression of the compassion of Jesus. They are a demonstration of the glory of Christ, identifying that his mission was divine. John commented after the miracle at Cana of Galilee, he says in John 2, 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. If we skip to John 11, the raising of Lazarus happened. Why? For the glory of God. So what, what were these miracles? More than just a demonstration of his compassion, but also a demonstration of the glory of God for, for the glory of God. What, whatever Christ did, whatever he said, whatever good was done was for one reason. Why? He was on a divine mission. And for that, re that reason, Scripture identifies that he was made flesh and dwelt among us. So we realize Jesus' nature was divine. His mission was divine. Why? Because he was sent of God. To do what? To bring glory to God. Lastly, for you this morning, Jesus' accomplishment is divine. His accomplishment. John 19, verse 30. It reads, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. It is finished. Can I remind us that the Christian faith does not begin with a big do, but with a big done? What do I mean? Our salvation has already been provided for. Jesus says, it is finished. We don't have to work for our salvation. We don't have to perform tasks for our salvation. Jesus already paid the price for our salvation. And he says, it is finished. His accomplishment is divine. I realize our, could I say it this way, our American activists reasoning 
loves to protest this, maybe not in word, but in demonstrations. We tend to believe if we don't get moving, how can we reach the goal? How can we ever achieve anything if we don't work for it? The fact is that if we seek to attain it, we already miss it. Jesus already said, it is finished. It is finished. Jesus, we believe, had accomplished for us what only God could accomplish. And understand, Jesus could accomplish it. Why? Because he's divine. He is God. We, we are now invited from the very outset to enjoy what Christ has already accomplished for us. The work of salvation has been completed. But realize, after now being saved, Christ has work prepared for each of us to do, which is why he has gifted each one of us, given us talents to, to serve within his body, to build up, to edify the church, and to reach out to the lost. I don't do that to be saved. I do it because I now am saved. There's a huge difference this morning, church. What we need, we can never accomplish. But the divine accomplishments of Christ meet our every needs. He's already done it for us. We just have to, by faith, receive it, accept it, enjoy the goodness, the blessings of God. Once again, salvation, salvation is a divine accomplishment. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was saying that the payment for humanity's sin has been made. Salvation has been accomplished. It now, now by faith, he would say, just receive it. As Christ prayed to the Father, he, he said this, John 17, verse 1, You have given your Son power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to, to, to as many as you have given him. He goes on to say, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. He says, it is finished. So salvation is not this unfinished project that Christ began on the cross and was somehow unable to complete. It's not a partial accomplishment whose completion is dependent on, on me joining the church, on you joining the church, on us being baptized, on us taking the Lord's Supper, on us doing all these wonderful, marvelous works. Our, our salvation, hear me, is not dependent upon that. The church likes to make it look like it's dependent upon that. But Jesus says it's already finished. It's already, it's already been made available for you. Titus says this, 3, 5, not, not by works of righteous, righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy has God saved us. This was a finished divine accomplishment. We can never have accomplished it ourselves. Now, now we have a choice whether we believe in it and by faith just receive salvation into our lives. It's part of the divine accomplishment of Jesus. The resurrection, John 20, I believe is one of the most important events in the entire life of Christ. His resurrection is a stamp of divine validation of his death as a payment in full for our salvation. Think of it this way. We are trusting the one who conquered death to provide each one of us eternal life. Can he do it? Sure he can. Because he's simply divine. Christ's resurrection might be the greatest single evidence that Jesus is divine. Only God himself could return from the dead and bring people back to life. Now, nobody else can, only God can do such a thing. And then he says, when he had said this, John 20, verse 22, he breathed on them. And said unto them, receive the Holy Ghost or receive the Holy Spirits. The daily, hourly infilling of the Holy Spirit wasn't just for the disciples. Then it's for us today. We, we, sit, we yet still need this today. Christ, Christ has provided his spirits. It's another one of his divine accomplishments. And yet we, like the early church, for whatever reason, need to be reminded once again over and over and over, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be, be filled with the Holy Spirits. Some would say, well, I thought we're already saved. 
we are saints. If we believed in Jesus, if, we, if we've accepted Jesus and professed him as the Lord of our life, but we need the Holy Spirit to live the life that God has purposed that we would live. To be, the, to be the light, to be the testimonies. But, but you shall receive power, Acts 1.8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. To do what? To be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. What, what, what does that mean? To be his witness. I think it begins, looks at it two ways. Number one, to live the lifestyle that God has purposed us to live. And let's be honest, we couldn't do that by ourselves. That's why we needed a Savior. So he has saved us, and he has now empowered us, if we're willing to receive it, with the Holy Spirit to live the life that we had been trying to live for him the whole time. And along with that, to share the goodness of Jesus. And through the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, our lifestyle and now our words can match up together. That that creates a good witness. You know, because if my lifestyles don't match the words that I say, I'm not a very credible witness, right? But I am much more credible if they align together. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do this to live the victorious life, to live the overcoming life, and then to proclaim the good news of Jesus to those that we come in contact with. So once again, like the early church, I remind you, as Scripture says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit here at Cornerstone Church. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. So the divine work and accomplishments of Christ are, are as a handle given to us by God on which our faith can lay holds. We can be saved Because of the divine accomplishments of Jesus, we we can experience eternal life because of the divine accomplishments of Jesus, who is simply divine. Every day, we can experience the spiritual empowerment of the Holy Spirit into our lives. Jesus has made that available for each one of us. All, All because why? Jesus is simply divine. Because he's divine. He can make this available for each one of us. I haven't even quoted the most famous verse in the Gospel of John. It's plastered everywhere. Some of you are wondering, is Pastor going to go all the way through the Gospel of John and not give us the most famous verse? Well, you know it. John 3, 16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. How could he do that? Because Jesus is divine. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning?